My name is John Winters. Um, I am a Lexington transplant. I've been here for a little over 10 years, originally from Connecticut, but I graduated from the University of Kentucky. Um, go Cats tonight, please. Um, and uh, we do prohibition, and this is Jessica. Yes, um, we're going to split this up, so if you get tired of one of us, just wait, because the next one is coming. Um, I'm Jessica Winters, and I am a local attorney. I actually just started my own solo practice here in town, and I went to UK undergrad and law school, and John and I have a little two-year-old son, so that's a little bit about us. I'm also a transplant. I moved here in 98 from Virginia, which is where I grew up, but my whole family is from Lexington, and so John and I have made Lexington our home, and we've set out to do whatever little things we can do to kind of make Lexington a better place to live, and we thank you for being here, and thank you for all that you do to make Lexington a better place to live, because if everybody does a lot, if everybody does a little, it makes a big difference. So um, without further ado, we're talking today about prohibition, and John's going to change the slides for me because I can't do two things at once. Um, and actually, like Celeste said, uh, taboo is a perfect topic for the Creative Morning conversation conversation about street art because while many artists um, depict taboo imagery or maybe have taboo messages in their art, street art is the only art form in which the actual creation of the art itself, the actual act of making the art is taboo or as the verb states there, placed under prohibition. And so that is actually how we got the name for Prohibition, the Street Art Festival here in Lexington. It's the word prohibition without the vowels because we needed to be cute. But uh, it's this idea that it is a, historically an art form that has been placed under prohibition. And also, I think it's a nod a bit to the time in our, our um, country where alcohol was prohibited. And then, of course, that came to an end. And what we're seeing today um, throughout the years is that the prohibitions on street art are being lifted. And it's increasingly coming into the mainstream. And cities all around the world are decriminalizing uh, street art. And so um, I think it has parallels to both. So any conversation about street art begins with the sort of overarching question, is it crime or is it art? And the black and white answer to that is, if, you, if the artist does not have the property owner's permission, it's a crime, they're a criminal, it's not art, it's vandalism. If they have the property owner's permission, then it's art, it's beautiful, everyone loves it. I would like to ask you today to think about circumstances in which it might not be such a black and white answer, that there might be a gray area where the message being communicated or the art itself is so important to us in our society and our dialogue that maybe it has worth even if it's not sanctioned. So, and actually, unsanctioned artwork is where we find the roots of street art in America. It actually started in the 1920s in New York with graffiti tagging by gangs to delineate their territories. And so graffiti is a form of writing using aerosol cans. And the writing is intended to be read by people who are part of the clique or the group who wrote it. And it's a subversive type of communication that's not meant to be understood by the public at large, which that's why a lot of times when you see a piece of graffiti, it says something, but you might not be able to read what it says. Only the people who understand the type of graffiti writing that's there would understand it. So it started as a subversive way to communicate, to mark territory, and it actually, um, over the years, though, you start to see the inclusion of more fine art aspects, the images. And in the 1970s and 80s in New York City, there was this proliferation of street art, and all of a sudden, artists are communicating in words um, that can be read by everyone. And there's, see more, the fine art inclusion there. And it becomes to where the text is clear. The text is in, written in a way that everyone can understand it. And this is a way for artists to communicate directly with the public, without a middleman, with no censorship. This is what I'm feeling, this is now. It's a way to challenge the establishment. It's a way for people who don't have a voice to communicate loudly. And they make their city a canvas. And you see during this time, street artists like Keith Haring here, coming out and becoming more mainstream and coming into the limelight these artists who have typically worked um, on unsanctioned walls in an illegal manner are being accepted by the art establishment. They're selling their pieces in galleries. They're working on commissioned walls. In New York City, this is a wall called the Bowery Street Wall, and it, it rotates from artist to artist. 
And so these are, you know, you're starting to see crossover from what has typically been a taboo prohibited art form coming into the mainstream and being desired by people in the art establishment. And the line between graffiti, street art, everything has so many different definitions. It's becoming blurred. Um, so the street art definition, there are so many, as I said, but the one I like the most is art that's on the street excluding territorial marking or vandalism. And in my mind, vandalism is the defacing of a piece of property that has no artistic value. And everyone might define vandalism differently, but that's the way I view it. Um, and so it's an interdisciplinary form. It has tagging or graffiti aspects, as you see here, that's the use of the aerosol can. There's stencil work, which is where an artist creates an image in advance and uses lasers or knives to cut out the image, and then they place it on the wall, and they use spray cans or paints to create the image on the wall. It's wheat pasting, which is a printed image that is attached to the wall using like, various types of glues and big brushes. And a lot of these things, because of the prohibited nature of street art, these are ways that artists can work in a manner that allows them to install a piece quickly, right? So a graffiti tag is something that goes up in 30 seconds. They're dun, 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 dun. A wheat paste is something they print out in advance, and then they can run up to a wall, slap it on with the paste, and then run away. And these art forms have developed because of the necessity of working in a quick pace, a lot of times under the cover of darkness. But as street art has become more mainstream and the restrictions on it have been lifted and people really want it in their communities, this whole world of uh, murals has developed, which we'll get to in a minute. But there's also other types of street art. Uh, there's stickers here, which again can be slapped up pretty quickly. There's tagging. There's hacking, so the hacking of public signs or um, electronic media to convey a message to the public. There's projection. There's sculptures and installation. Yarn bombing, which we see some in Lexington also. And then here's the murals. So as communities desire this work, it allows the artist to spend more time on a piece and to really get into their technique. They use different media. They have spray cans sometimes. Sometimes it's acrylics. They use paintbrushes. They use photos to make their work look more photorealistic. And it really straddles the line. I mean, this is a piece that you might think you would see in a, a, a famous gallery. And, um, and that's what we are working to bring to Lexington, is to allow the street artists to have a little bit of free reign creatively and to be able to take their time on creating a piece that speaks to us. And of course, street art is socio-political. Um, from its very inception, as I said before, it's a way for a marginalized population to speak and to communicate with the public, even if their views might not be the mainstream. It's anti-establishment, and it's a way to communicate. So you see here, um, Shepard Ferry and a collective of artists created this series of We the People posters in response to the inauguration and in support of the Women's March that happened in January. And um, so that's one manner, the posters. And you see this artist, Banksy, he uh, did this mural on the Gaza barrier. And it's, it's a way for artists to give voice to a viewpoints that might otherwise be suppressed. And it's raw. And it might not make everyone happy. Not, you know, it's, it's, meant to, it's meant to engender debate. It's meant to make people angry or to wake you up out of your normal thing when you're going around. It's meant to make you pay attention and think about a different perspective than maybe that you have. Um, and that's the beauty of street art. And <laughs> oh, again, the slogans. But this is why, and they use the city as a canvas and a message board. And so this is a Google image. This piece has gone up all around the world. And the community makes it their own. They take photos in front of it. They post them online. And so it's a way to connect us all. This one artist, or maybe many artists, putting the same slogan up on walls all around the world. And then people making it their own is a beautiful thing. But because street art has for so many years been prohibited and there are criminal laws against it, a lot of artists work anonymously. They have pseudonyms. And this is because many of them work on unsanctioned walls. And actually, there's a subset of street artists that believe it's only legit if you don't have permission. <laughs> if you have permission, it's no longer street art. And so, but there are two 
ways to look at that. The other group of artists says, well, even if I have permission, I'm still able to convey the message that I want. I still get to work in the media that I want. I'm still a legitimate street artist, even if I'm not illegal. And so um, and the anonymity in street art is also changing because uh, now these artists are being able to sell pieces in galleries and they're being able to support themselves and make money off their art. And so with that, it's a trade-off. You can't necessarily sell your art or become commercially successful unless you reveal your identity, Batman. Um, and so these artists working, they know that their art is temporary. And this is something that John and I have learned because we put so much into these murals and we love them so much, but when we see them... Uh, disappear, it, it was very upsetting the first time it happened. But in speaking with the artists, they all convey the message, look, we know it's temporary. When it goes up, by virtue of the fact that it's going on a wall, a building that doesn't belong to us, maybe an unsanctioned wall, it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the community. And guess what? By that very nature, it's going to be temporary, and there's going to come a time when it's not there anymore. But the beautiful thing about street art is that it's constantly regenerating. When one piece disappears, Another one pops up in its place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another one pops up in its place. <laughs> and the idea is, this is, um, you know, we don't live in a museum, so our art should not all be in museums. There should be art on our streets that we all have access to that doesn't require a ticket. And this... Um, and because of this, actually, street art has been dubbed one of the most influential art movements in modern history. And it has led to the proliferation of street art festivals around the world. So Prohibition, we're little, we're kind of small potatoes here. There are hundreds of street art festivals in cities all around the world, and many of them are much larger than ours. We're talking hundreds of artists and hundreds of walls and walls that get painted over every year and big corporate sponsors and so it brings out a wide, can I switch out? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll switch out to John. <laughs> He'll tell you about street art festivals. We finish each other's sentences on occasion. Um, yeah, so for us, we kind of noticed this thing, um, especially for me growing up in Connecticut, traveling to Boston and traveling to New York City and, and kind of seeing art everywhere and um, being obsessed with street art and then realizing that it wasn't only on the streets, it was also people holding these festivals all over the world. Um, and the cool thing for us is that it really brings people who may not be a part of the art establishment or may not be a part of kind of even street art out into the streets to see it being made. Um, a lot of you may know uh, Wynwood Walls and, uh, you know, the Art Basel in, in Miami that's every year. It's probably one of the most famous in the world. Again, hundreds of artists, massive budgets. I wish we had like a millionth of it. Um, but, uh, you know, and then it extends to places as, as you know, this is from Richmond, Virginia. Um, and, you know, it's, it's big art collectors in Miami, and it's just normal people. Um, and this is an image from a street art festival that's actually in China. Um, so it spans the entire globe. It's a massive thing. Um, and it's um, a really great way, we feel like, for people to come out in, some way, in a way that you can't do in a gallery. You walk into a gallery, that piece is done. You know, you can come out into the street and watch an artist create a work um, and really kind of become part of the festival yourself. Um, and we love just the fact, especially here, but also seeing pictures like this where it's, you know, tons of artists working and everyone's coming out and enjoying themselves and being a community around the art. Um, so to talk about Prohibition a little bit, we started Prohibition in 2011. Um, it was literally started over a conversation about Netflix. Um, Jessica was on, was traveling for work and she gave me a call and she said, what movie should I watch? And I was like, you should see Exit Through the Gift Shop. And she's like, oh, okay. So she watched it. And about an hour and a half later, she calls me back. She goes, we should have a street art show. <laughs> I went, yeah, okay, honey, we'll talk tomorrow. And uh, so now we have a street art show. <laughs> um, that pretty much sums up our relationship, actually. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you have probably seen it. If you haven't, please look it up. It's really interesting. Kind of centers around Banksy and a lot of other you know, world-famous street artists. Um, it's a fantastic intro. Um, definitely check it out. So, we started out with, with a focus on having a local gallery. The first year was, you know, taking artists like, um, like Dronex and, and, and a lot of other, uh, 
Hello Mona and our friends Kent Montgomery and, and a lot of great people who were working outside and were working on the streets. I pretty much can guarantee there's not a single person in here who hasn't seen a drone X. I mean, the guy's been everywhere. So we were trying to get these guys in, off the streets, into a gallery, um, doing something non-traditional, doing something, it was at Buster's, it had a music component, it was crazy. Um, we were literally like uh, using a hammer drill to like push masonry screws into a wall the night before. So, um, so that's how we got started, um, doing something non-traditional, doing something a little more punk rock, a little bit outside the mainstream, um, because that's how the art is. Um, then in 2012, we worked with Kurt and Cremena, who a lot of you may know, is they um, do the Unlearned Fear and Hate Project. Um, we worked with them to help bring Harakut. So they were the, the first kind of outside of the art establishment um, mural that came to town that we we're really happy to, to help with. And that gave us kind of the inspiration to go, well, why can't we do it? Um, so the next year, we jumped in way over our heads um, and brought, uh, we brought four artists, one of which being Eduardo Cobra, um, who literally emailed us a month and a half before. And I told Jessica, I said, we can't do this. We can't do this. She said, no, we're going to do it. And, and we did. Um, <laughs> again, the theme. Um, so that really was our first, our, our first experience in this. You know? and, and since then, we've been able to bring some amazing artists from all around the world. Uh, MTO, who came to us from France. Um, Mr. Dayon Prizwan, who came to us from Portugal. We've had people from Belgium, the UK, New York, LA, I mean, all over the place. Um, and some of our favorites, uh, the duo How and Nazem, who are from uh, New York City. If anyone's seen that mural lately, someone has sprayed over their name and just tagged Ernie on top of it. So apparently, I mean, it happens. It's pretty funny, I think it's funny. But um, anyway, so we have How and Nazem. So I want to give you a little, a little tip on kind of how we operate. Um, <laughs> I, that's a really old reference. It's from the Just the Two of Us video. It literally, so it's just, it's not funny. <laughs> I try really hard on that one. Um, so it literally is just the two of us. Um, we have volunteers and we have interns now and then, but um, we don't have a staff. We don't have employees. We don't take, um, uh, we don't take uh, salaries, nothing. We have some amazing supporters. LexArts acts as our our fiscal agent, they process all of our donations, um, everything's tax deductible. Um, the other benefit to that is that every single cent that comes into prohibition goes into art. There's every single thing that we do has to be invoiced, every single thing has to be related to art, so that way there's no overhead, there's no nothing else. Um, we also work through Kickstarter. We have some large donors like LFUCG, LexArts, um, a few others who support us, but Almost 90% of what we use and what we need comes from the community. Um, people who feel the need to support us, who want to support public art, which is amazing. Um, and then in the last year, we started partnering with the Lexington Art League. So our little gallery that was in a bar, <laughs> that was in a, you know, up on brick walls, is now in this gorgeous, gorgeous building. Um, and so we're going to be working with them to do more artist talks, do more programming. Um, and uh, we're really excited to see where that goes uh, in the coming years. So our project is also a year-round planning thing. We start, the day it ends, we start talking to artists and we start planning for walls. Um, and it runs all the way through. Um, we have an extremely tight budget. We spend about three to $4,000 a mural. Most large public mural projects spend somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty to about $125,000 a mural. Um, so we try to do a lot more whoop, with a lot less and not push buttons. Um, so, and then also we really, it boils down to for us, it's a crazy month. Um, the month of October, usually we are up at six in the morning. We're down at about two in the morning. Um, we usually have somewhere between two and four artists staying at our house. We're shuffling people in, in between places. We're ordering paint. We're getting coffee. We're trying to figure out who flooded a bathtub in a hotel. Um, that did happen one year. Um, so it's, it's, for us, it's the two of us, and it's awesome. We love it. Um, it's an absolute blast. But yeah, it, it is nuts. And then we try to sleep through most of November, which is great. Um, so a lot of people kind of ask us why we do this. Um, and 
So a big part of it for us is we want to bring something that we see somewhere else here to Lexington. Lexington is our home. We've been here for 10 years. We're not going anywhere. Um, and, you know, we wanted to see, we saw something beautiful and we knew that we could have it here. So we try to bring something beautiful from the world back to us, um, but also to connect, try and connect Lexington to the world. So a lot of our artists who come in, we try and get our local artists to go out and, you know, help out or talk or, you know, come over for dinner and, um, you know, really try to bring, not only bring them in, but also to export some of us back out. Really, the other part was, why not? Um, <laughs> we just, we figured that we could do it, um, you know, and, and we didn't know what we were doing. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing. We still don't have any idea what we were doing. Um, but that was our thing. It was, you know, if someone gives you an opportunity and, and we felt like we had created an opportunity for ourselves, we said, why not? Um, and a big part of what we do is say yes. Um, we, you know, with Cobra coming a month and a half before, who speaks Portuguese, which I don't even come remotely close to speaking, um, <laughs> doing this huge project, and, and Jessica said, we're gonna do it. And we said yes, and it worked. And, you know, so far we've been able to keep continuing to try and do cool things, and try and keep saying yes to people. Um, and also don't take no for an answer. Um, a lot of people told us we couldn't do it too, and we just didn't listen to them. Um, and, you know, and, and we just push for kind of something that we feel is important, that, you know, to highlight our local artists, to bring in amazing outside art, and to keep doing something that we feel really passionate about. Um, this quote is on my coffee mug, and I was making the slideshow and I read it, and I was like, that's perfect. Um, it really is something that I feel like is really at the core of what we do. Um, we like to do cool shit. Um, I curse, damn it. Um, but really, that, that's our thing is like, if you wake up and you don't like what you're doing, do something else. And for us, we woke up and went, we should have a street art show. So we did. And we keep doing it because we think it's cool. So it's kind of fun. Anyway, um, so that's us. That's Prohibition. Thank you guys so much for, uh, for listening to us.